Hi folks. We are writers from the Chatham Writers Group that meets weekly at the Eldridge Library in Chatham, uh, Monday mornings. And we've recently received this lovely invitation to uh, come together tonight and share some of our poetry. We were thrilled to get the invitation. And um, uh, we thought we would uh, share with you uh, some of our favorite poems. I, I know I'm going to be paraphrasing, but uh, the poet Muriel Ruckheiser once said that um, the world is filled with, is made up of uh, stories, not atoms. And I think we're probably all in agreement that yes. that's the case. So the chance to share some stories with you tonight in po poetry form um, is really uh, engaging and enticing for us. So we're happy that you're able to join us tonight. Let me introduce my other um, colleagues for the evening, and then we'll get started and share some poems with you. So to my right is uh, Jerry McDowell, and I'll give you a little bio about Jerry. Jerry is a retired Virginia lawyer who now lives in Chatham. He was a federal prosecutor with the Justi Justice Department for 34 years. He teaches Tai Chi Chuan at the Chatham Community Center. Glad to have you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Got some great poems coming tonight. And next, Karen Hayes is one of our newer members. She's uh, new to the Cape as well from Chicago by way of Japan and Seattle and most recently San Diego. She's a traveler, an English professor, an acupuncturist, a Chinese herbalist, a psycho-spiritual stewardess for the Kabbalistic tarot of the spirit, a committed Zen practitioner and writer. She finds no shortage of fodder for her muse without whose companionship she could not manage. Karen is deeply grateful to be on the Cape, surrounded by countless ways to remain inspired. And when Karen reads some poetry, you'll see that she truly is inspired as a poet. Um, how about if I go over to the lady on my left, and I will tell you a little bit about Mary Ellen Eichmann. She's a native of New York. She moved to Cape Cod in 2011, following her work as a hospital chaplain. Her previous employments included development director for a New York inner city elementary school and membership in a parish spiritual renewal team. This first year in the Chatham Writers Group has prompted her to stop and think about the stuff of life and then find the right words to express it. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> and uh, finally, to my far left is Tom Johnson. Tom, uh, is a Jesuit educated, often retired educator for whom writing poetry and trying to understand politics is his lifeline to a balanced existence. Married for half a century to the same beautiful woman, Beverly, he is father to a poet daughter and a boat building son, both of whom excel in relationships, laughter, and parenting. Three grandchildren and golf course and golf complete his being, living in Harwichport in a historic property with its own story. And um, maybe Mary Ellen could tell a little bit about sure, me. I'd be happy to. Diane de Janeiro was on the floor playing with her kindergarten class one day in Vermont. She blinked, and when she opened her eyes, it was 30 years later. She was gray, and they were grown. Leading a charmed life, she next found herself on the shores of Cape Cod with her husband, two grown children, and her first grandchild. She finds magic in all of her undertakings, volunteering at the Children's Center, renovating an aging Victorian home, gardening with the master gardeners, designing programs for the Garden Club of Harwich, and freelancing articles. Most recently, she has been conjuring up magical moments with the word wizards in the Chatham Writers Group. Thank you. You're welcome. So there you have it, a little something about us. And uh, now we'd like to share some of our poems and uh, maybe talk a little bit about them. So join us. Uh, Jerry, 
Would you like to start off with one? Sure. It's a poem about a good friend that I made here on the Cape called Tomorrow. Not so long ago, we met at your house. You gave us a plate of warm cookies and a bowl of spice trail mix and nuts. We talked about investments, which might double in five years, or wallow, stagnant in recession, if we could only grasp the future that would come. There was no investment that would have made a difference. The tomorrow that came was not one I considered when I sat at your table and thought about chocolate chips instead of return on equity. I was in Key West looking through the open blinds at an orange cat roaming around a palm tree in front of my room when I got a call from a friend in Chatham where it was still winter. Peg's dead, he said, this morning, a little after three. Our investment club met this week. All the partners took a long moment of silence for you. I thought of a time when all futures stop and all that matters returns to dust. The moment ended. It was time for the treasurer's report. Mm. Just thought I'd start you out on a happy Real, I, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that, that piece, um, you had such a great balance between the everyday commonplace of what you were doing and then the, the bigger issue of, of someone's death, and um, it balanced it well uh, in that piece. Any other thoughts mm. about it? Well, what's it uh, she, she was a very accomplished woman, a, a businesswoman, and uh, actually kind of led it, kept us on, on topic when we were trying to discuss which docs to buy. And, uh, she seemed so full of life, it just didn't seem, mm. yeah. Yeah. you didn't yeah. think about yeah. things like that until it yes. happened, and then, uh, and then this seemed to be as good a way to put my feelings about her and into uh, something permanent. Yeah. Did, how long um, a span between when she died and when you were able to write that? Because I think it's sometimes hard to write about heavy emotions like that. Right away. This is probably a year or two yeah. afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you had some distance on mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Nicely done. A nice memorial to your friend. All right. Thank you. Karen. Okay. This is this poem is called Japan. Ghosts, past, present, future. Visitations pressing down and in. Finding me hanging on just to a single red thread sent postage paid by the rising sun. Escape. Castles, shrines, temples, Buddhas for the 10,000 things. Incense intoxication. Hanami, cherry blossoms, pale pink popcorn, spring too in March. Momiji, a sweep of maple blaze, bless autumn. Strangers abandon agendas and lead me not towards but to the right train. New friends, eager students, exotic cuisine, all on the menu of my current life as I re-enter the world. Nourishment in the 10,000 ways. Tea time, hot ocha, grassy yellow green, verdant. A company knee time, sitting seiza, Legs tucked under neatly. Ingenious body as furniture, bend and fold maneuver. Space to yourself. Mm. Like sure. building an image of a culture using topography and what exists, tangible things. You know. And you really did build an image. With, and the, yeah. the choice of your imagery um, really painted a picture for us of what that was yeah. like. What, was tell us done. a little bit about <coughs> the background of why you chose to write that. Sure. Um, there was, I, I don't know if it was evident in the poem, but there were, uh, the very beginning of the poem sort of um, is meant to give the sense that I needed to get, get away. Oh, and. Yeah. Uh, right. And then this was sort of my redemption, or my resurrection was found mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, what made me write about it. Um, because although this happened over 20 years ago, um, it still remains one of the most influential periods of my life, I would say. So it's, it's right there still in my mind, yeah. I think for all of us, those pivotal moments in our lives, we mine them for uh, you know, our writing over and over again. And do you think that changes our view of that, of whatever that pivotal moment is, changes a little over time? So we can keep coming back to it. And well, it's all experiential. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole litany is experiential. Mm. But it's also uh, gives a clear picture of what it is, the culture that I don't want to say allows it, but promotes and has these things as their tangible representation mm -hmm. of their soul, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. In such contrast to this culture. Yeah. 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 The 10,000 things that you talk about, is that reality that? Uh, the 10,000 things uh, expression comes from, I believe it's Taoism, but it's, it's talked about in, in Asian uh, philosophy as sort of um, to represent everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Single words, really, you chose words that painted a full picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to read one um, called All That Remains. And um, it's the idea of a tragedy and uh, coming back to find uh, your your house having burned down. And for some reason, I, I've got it pictured in my mind as happening in the Adirondacks. Mm. Um, but as is so often the case, I can't be totally bleak in, in the conclusion. So, you know, <laughs> yes. there's always redemption at the end. Always, yeah. All that remains. The stalwart hellebores should have been the spring sentinels guiding the searchers to the spot yet they cowered beneath the overhang of ferns. It was left to April's foot soldiers, the white snowdrops, to proclaim rebirth. This day found them pushing up through cold, smoldering ash. Foundation stones stood unsheathed, all wood seared to cinders. Save for the back bedroom lintel, like a prize fighter after the bell, it rested on bended knee, readying for a rematch. An iridescent voyeur, the crow, head cocked, waited for the signal to reclaim. It came in the fluted movement of white, chuffing in the breeze, stuck by pine pitch to the charred hearthstone. A postcard of Niagara Falls, bestowed with a mystical quality of a treasure map, edges singed, blackened, sooted, and secret. Only the words, love, mom and dad, to guide the seekers home. Mm. Did that? Did that happen? No. <laughs> but in my mind, it yeah. very clearly did. I had yeah. this view of this cabin where yeah. a whole family had, um, you know, spent all these summers yeah. together, yeah. and um, that—that's what was left after the fire. But that they were able to come back and find the find it. And well, a representation of the postcard, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. the Niagara Falls in ash. Uh, that's very uh, poignant. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. All right, and that is all that remains of that one, too. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Mary Ellen, what do you have for us? Um, we'll all remember last winter when we had um, quite a bit of snow. Hard to forget and that one. We decided one week in the group to uh, to talk about the weather mm -hmm. and to to speak of it in any way that seemed right to you. And and so um, this was a poem I wrote um, entitled "A Winter Lament." Another three to six inches reports the woman. It's a familiar prediction inches upon inches of winter's cold reality. There's fear about falling on frozen wooden steps, followed by anger when the fall happens, bruised and incapable. Worry intrudes of unplowed driveways and 
frozen car doors. But does it really matter? Syrian summers are long and dry, winters rainy and cold. Three million people have fled their homes, walking hundreds of miles from places called Aleppo or homes to borders with limited welcome. War has spread its heartless cruelty as women escape holding only the hands of their children or worthless elders. These vulnerable ones have seen more violence than hearts should bear. Family, friends, neighbors are gone. Classrooms have been destroyed. Children of war are learning other lessons like the need for food and water or the longing for a tent to protect from harsh weather. Another three to six inches, reports the woman. Snow falls again, the temperature drops, plans are postponed. But home is warm and food is plenty. A good book waits on the bedside table. Another three to six inches, she repeats, but does it really matter? Now you made that up, right? <laughs> mm. Wow. Well, no. Terrific. You <laughs> took such a common occurrence, the weather, and then as you get into it, uh, it becomes so apparent that you're dealing with, you know, such a major issue as the war. Um, it it really juxtapositioned it so beautifully, and then when you brought it back around at the end, back to the weather reminding us, you know, how important is yes. it really, given what people in what other people parts of the world. Through, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And both of those stories were on the news mm. often during that yeah. time, as, mm. as, right, that. as they are yeah. now in, in, yeah. in greater ways through people try to, to find uh, places to live. But um, it was just remarkable to me when you'd see children, you know, mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. of war just trying I mean, to. Yeah. The, the, you know, the contrast, you're sitting in your living room and you know it's going to snow, you have w food and a book, but the world comes in through the television and it's yes. about the children there. And I remember that the tents and they're trying to sustain themselves through winter in different countries. Mm. That's very poignant. Mm. Yeah, thank you. It's the whole uh, um, using something so basic and common like weather to get to a deeper point right. was the same that you did with uh, you know, your group, your stock group, to get to a deeper point of, um, you know, missing your friend. So, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, are we ready? Tom. Tom, yes. wait, tell us, yeah. make sure you tell us how you get these poems, because um, it's a little different than how we get poetry. Well, yeah, what we do is we get a prompt every week, and um, I have a very creative printer, so in the evening I usually put the prompt on the uh, printer and when I go to bed the morning I hit enter mm -hmm. and this is what comes out. <laughs> it's quite uh, It's so <laughs> much more convenient than it how is. the <laughs> rest of us who struggle for days and weeks Although to come up with what happened was something. once I put Ogden Nash's book on top of the printer <laughs> when I first bought it and so I think the printer is trying to be more like Ogden Nash. Uh, I see. Which is Treasures and Trash by Ogden Nash. This is owed to Co uh, Copeland's fanfare for a common man which was our prompt if you remember that. <clears throat> the fanfare for the common man uh, may have gotten out of hand. Copeland's instruments were very brassy, but the title ignored the importance of lassies. Now we all know that men are strong, some use it well, some others go wrong, but a composer who ignores the ladies has an opus that's a little shady. What went through Copeland's mind as he labored through the composer's grind, silent listening of his sharps and flats while jotting them down as this and that, focusing on his common man theme, unaware that this composer's dream let all the women out of sight. Did he really lack demographic insight? That in concert halls rotundas lounged very wealthy funders, included well-heeled female donors, many of whom were wealthy loners, 
They outlive the male soulmates or benefit from divorce's high stakes. Imagine how they would react to the title's barefaced exclusionary fact. That the common man should solely receive a fanfare with exclusive reprieve that ignores in its celebration one half of the Earth's population. The fairer sex was ignored as Copeland carefully scored his fanfare for the common man, for Jimbo, Harry, Tom, and Dan, who often badly behave in messy, smelly, manly caves with music <laughs> devoid of any fanfare, and probably few of them even care that a lovely piece was composed, that by title absolutely closed the door to female connections, which are often tied to their affections. <laughs> so Copeland needs to connect the fairest sex that's been decked and reshape his piece anew to include a musical womenly cue. Thus the fanfare needs to be changed, the title and rhythm rearranged. It will then have more appeal to the common woman of fair deal. <laughs> 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 Don't ask me where it comes Don't from. Don't ask. Just, uh, <laughs> I can't help myself. Well, that yeah. really takes Copeland down a peg or two, I think. <laughs> well, and he deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you, when you write these lengthy <clears throat> rhyming pieces, do you have a sense of where you want it to go and you're in control of that? No. Just, no. It just comes. So it just, it just, I don't know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. It just comes. Gosh. Yeah. It's a problem all the time. You see, I always think in rhyme. Wow. <laughs> yes. We, we yes, didn't we even see that coming. <laughs> no, yeah, no. We're totally, totally blindsided yeah. by that. Yeah. Well, uh, let's... Wait to hear the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it will be uh, as rhymeful. Yeah. Um, uh, let's just uh, <clears throat> speak for a minute about the idea of the prompts, because you had mentioned the yes, prompts. Yes, right. In our um, group that meets once a week, we are given a prompt by a wonderful prompt uh, meister, um, Jeff, who uh, is brilliant at coming up with topics to write about. And um, we all get the prompt on Monday morning, and we have a week to write. We can write uh, prose, we can write poetry, we can write a rant. Uh, you know, anything we want, basically, a letter Ho to the hopefully editor. Hopefully under a thousand words. Under a thousand words. Uh, and then we bring it back. And the amazing thing is that the writing just is so incredibly different. Um, there's a wide variety of how people take that prompt. Yes. And I think that's why half of us come, just to oh, see absolutely. what everybody else yes. comes up with. Oh, it's yes. wonderful. It's yeah. fascinating. Wonderful. Um, so if you'd like to join us at any point, stop by at the Eldridge Library on Monday mornings at 1030. And um, these prompts are just uh, amazing. Yep. Uh, so we get yeah. a lot of writing through that, I would say. We do. All right. Let's see. Jerry, you have something else for us? Well, I have a happier note. <laughs> oh. Uh, in fact, this follows right on from, from Tom. We had a prompt, um, I think it was about two things, right, about two things. Mm -hmm. So I thought about the two different kinds of poems that we hear in the group. Tom's printed, prints out the yeah. rhymed poem about Brady and his lady. And <laughs> I'm talking about some friend who died a horrible death and <clears throat> yeah. no it's rhyme and hardly any alliteration. <laughs> so I wrote about the two kinds of, of uh, poets. Excellent segue here. It's called mm. People of Poetry. Ending sounds correspond in meter that fits, ruling out a love poem to an orange. When a stanza or two takes hours to write, best not end a sentence with lozenge. Oh, there's them that rhyme and keep precise time when they have something to say. Disciples of Shakespeare, readers of Frost, old school rules applied for today. Others write with concision and wit, with no care about lines that are rhyming. As long as ideas stir their mind and their heart, they don't ob obsess about timing. <laughs> oh, there's some never rhyme, need a watch to keep time when they have something to say. Their verse runs quite freely, now touchy, then feely. <laughs> Walt Whitman showed them the way. <laughs> Not in either camp, I just respond to the prompt, grinding out words much as a blogger will. Poet, poet Peter would claim this is no poem at all, but seven stanzas of time wasting doggerel. <laughs> See, nobody died to make that yeah. nobody. 
<laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And now, was that harder for you to do in rhyme? Is it? I could give you some story about putting this on my router. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, morning. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was hard. I, I normally would not try to rhyme a poem because it's tough enough to say what you mean without saying what you mean in rhyme yeah. or meter. I think that's yeah. very, very difficult. Yeah. So I don't try it. But every once in a while, <coughs> you know, Just something gets in you. you. Get the urge to, to yeah. Just get the urge to do it. Yeah. I noticed, I, I, as I'm reading it, I can see where I would change it if I had to write <laughs> it again. Yeah. But it's very difficult to come up with a rhyme for lozenge, by the way. <laughs> That's duly noted. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Avoid that. Not going to try that anytime right. soon. And did you use the word orange? Yes. At the, the beginning. And, and orange and lozenge. Very I close. deliberately did not. Yeah, yeah. They don't rhyme, but some books say they do. They I, do. Huh. I wanted to put them in to show the preposterousness of a book that says orange and lozenge awesome. rhyme. You got the ad <laughs> thing going. Well, you know, when I've, I've tried to um, follow your lead and write in rhyme, and I'll, I'll, I'll get like two or three lines that just flow and they're perfect, and so then I want to keep going. And then as I'm going, I realize it's taking me to another place that I didn't want to go. Yeah, and the meter is a tough one too. Oh, mm. yeah. The, the syllabic. You really have uh, to have rhythm, the ear yeah. for it. Mm. And yeah. then I end up giving up because um, it ends up leading me instead of me leading it. Mm. So. If mm. I could uh, give a shout out, I mentioned poet Peter yes. in the poem. And Peter Saunders of Chatham <coughs> uh, started this group in another century. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Jeff and I, and maybe some others, uh, were in his group. And when he wanted to move to the afternoon, we stayed in the morning and, and also decided to meet most of the year. But he, he's still the spiritual uh, yeah. godfather mm -hmm. of our group. So that was the reference to Poet Peter. His mm -hmm. email address is poetpeter at something or other in, yeah. in Chatham. And, and he's still quite active. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's written a number of very good books. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's all I all right. to say on that topic. Thank you. Perfect, uh, perfect ending for uh, Tom's Tom's piece. So, do you have something else? For I, us, do. Karen? I do. I do. I do. All right. Anything you want to tell us about it beforehand? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> if you have questions we'll go in cold. after, yes, let me know. Absolutely. This is called Current Events. Just stop and pet the cat. He's clearly positioned himself in your way, already purring, though you've done nothing for it. Exposing his belly skyward, though you've only just stepped into the room. Groceries can wait. Look at mail later. It's only bills you can't pay. And stop. Stop mostly ruminations about how things could be better. When what could be better than this invitation this enormous orange striped regal tiger Richard with whom you are house sitting. So sit in this house. No, better lie down next to his unconditional impressiveness and let him show you for the low, low cost of his company how to make yourself at home. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. You couldn't have picked a better wow. scenario with the cat showing you how to stay present. You know, that was brilliant wow. to connect it to the cat. They are good teachers. <laughs> you know, and it reminded me, you know, the great spiritual writers um, have reminded us often that really what do we have but just this moment. Mm -hmm. So to have a cat draw you into that moment. And yeah. Yeah. And I loved the unconditional... Impressiveness. Yeah. 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 Love it. Wonderful. Thank you. That kind of sums up cats, doesn't it? Well, yes, yeah. I mm -hmm. think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Your beginning, just stop, really <coughs> sets the tone for the whole piece. And it really is your theme. That's mm -hmm. what the, mm -hmm. the message that you want to... Mm -hmm. Uh, get get through. It's a very clear picture. Hmm. It's a very clear picture coming with the groceries 
and he's there and he sees him. Yeah, very clear. <laughs> and yet, how many times do you walk past? Oh, you know? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Have a good yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Stop. Yeah. Karen, thank <coughs> you. Thank you. It was beautiful. Um, I have one called Lyrics Lost, and it comes from um, my wondering at, about aging. And I play this game with myself. If I was going to lose some of my senses, which one could I most uh, afford to lose? And I always thought, well, sight. I, I, you know, I need to hear things, though. And so I ended up writing about a woman who lost her hearing and, um, and basically how she is dealing with it and tries to recreate um, her hearing. So it's called Lyrics Lost. <laughs> Deafness rang hollow, holding space for her memory to recreate sounds. Lilting laughter, Jack's raspy cough, the snap of her change purse. Buddy's wet nose touching the back of her knee triggered the memory of a sharp bark. But what of her own mother's voice? She wafted, searching beyond recall, flowing into tenderness, feeling mother's thumb catching chocolate sauce on her chin, sweet tobacco dancing with husky musk. It pulled her to her mother's lap, she paused, leaving space for her mother to speak. It would not come. It would not come. Her deafness lost its lyrics then and deepened into silence. That's a goose bumper. Yeah. Thank you. Diane, your poems are too damn good. <laughs> You're just saying <coughs> that, Jerry. It makes us all think. Ah. When yeah. you were reading that, I started to try to hear uh, my mother's voice. Mm -hmm. It sort of could, but mm -hmm. then I wanted to pay attention to where the poem was going. Mm -hmm. But it was very, very good. Well, you know, I was trying to put myself in, what would that be like if I didn't have the ability mm -hmm. to hear? There'd be this blankness, but in that blankness, there'd be the opportunity to, to remember sound. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And then I was, well, you know, trying to remember, my mom passed away, and trying to remember, you know, what her voice would be like. Yes. Um, you know, the interesting, the, uh, the Jesuits taught that the difference between us human beings and animals is the ability to reflect on our experience, and uh, you, you reflected on an experience that you have yet to have and imagined what it would be like. Mm -hmm. It was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way you described yeah. it and the, you know, the, how you, the thing she remembered is the way she recalled things. So it was very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, several weeks ago when we were given the prompt, uh, create a character with the name Brady, mm. or write about a Brady who we might oh, yeah. we might know and admire. <laughs> yeah. or, but um, I don't know why it came into my mind to write about a golf caddy in Ireland whose name was Brady. But in order to get some of the background <coughs> of that, I went. I found a journal my mother kept when. Um, when we were all gone out of the house, my mother started to travel. Mm -hmm. And she traveled to Ireland. But she, was, she was all Irish. She was Buckley and Boyne and Duffy and everything. And, um, but the great thing about it, my mother, when she traveled, she wrote every single day mm. about so what she saw that day. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, but, but her voice came to me too in the reading of her travel journals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful wow. mm -hmm. yeah. experience of mm -hmm. of that of mm -hmm. voice and remembering and hearing. Yeah, yeah. that's great. All right. And Funny. do you have another poem for us? I do. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering about. Um, um, Okay. Is there anything you want? Well, I thought 
maybe, I, obviously I'm trying to make up my mind, but let's, let's go, um, I'd actually write to yeah, read something here if I may. Sure. Um, because it was my um, feeble attempt at humor, at some humor, and, um, and it was the prompt that we received about the two characters from Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. She's so, mm -hmm. so familiar with the sensation of never being wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I wrote this um, for my sister and in honor of my sister, and uh, she's not heard it, so this will be fun. Um, <laughs> the title of this is, She's So Familiar With This Sensation. There she sits, a younger sister, a mere 34 inches away, it is she who is the neophyte, a youngster to this game of logic and memory. Bridge is a card game which challenges the mind. What suit to bid when the points are strong? Which card has been thrown and which has been not? One plays with a partner, an intended ally. We're in this as a team of two, and yet this familiar woman across the table so new to the game, knows its mysteries better than I, and that makes me angry. She is the math major, so clever in her thinking. It is she who grasps this cerebral sport, knows what has been played and who holds the winners. I, the older, more experienced player, wonder, what the hell should I lead now? Wasn't she the one whose hand I held crossing streets? Didn't I give her my Ginny doll to quiet her crying at school's beginning? I fixed her hair for the prom. I explained the facts of life, sort of. Now we've crossed over to the other side. I've played this game for years. She is the novice. I feel my way through. She is the thinker. She counts cards, knows conventions, understands the basics and beyond, and integrates them all. She has become a scholar of the game, knowing when the nine of diamonds will take the trick. The rotten nine of diamonds. <laughs> and in her presence, I look forward to the tea break. Bridge is a game that is never the same twice. Each hand is always new and different. Really? The distribution of cards may change, but a smart younger sister is always the same. She's never wrong. While that trait is finessed beyond my reach, she has become so familiar with this sensation. Wow. Mm. <coughs> 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 the other play bridge to understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, you do. Oh, yeah. Don't you hate playing with people like that. Oh gosh. Oh my God. But you really she's captured fun. her. She's fun. Yeah. You yeah. know the sister relationship. Uh -huh. Oh, it could yeah. have been. Yeah. You said it with Bridge, and that was a perfect choice. But it could be with a million things. You, the idea of the the sisterly um, s switching over. You know, from the the uh, eldest to suddenly the the younger getting really good at and something. The, yeah. Um, and just that tug, always that tug between sisters. Yeah. You know, that came through with such love and, um, you know, just fun, mm -hmm. good humor about the whole thing. Oh, yes. And she's, she's very funny. And she's great to have as a bridge party. Although there are those moments. Ah. Oh. Those it was, perfect aren't there moments. Always it was a mixture of love, <laughs> awe, and resentment. Yes. <laughs> yes. Actually, yeah. that hits yeah. it perfect. Yeah. 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 Love, awe, and resentment. <laughs> Well, now I hope she sees this. So no, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope so. And I hope she does have a good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. That was sure. Thank you. Very good. All right, Tom. Uh, you know, this one, the have... prompt for this one was uh, several years ago, and it was uh, the song has ended, but the melody lingers on. Okay. Mm. And again, I put it on my printer, and in the morning, this is what came out. It's entitled, The Tunes That Never Cease. <clears throat> oh, the echoes that taunt my brain, sweet lyrics and haunting refrain. 
They keep me awake and humming out loud, whether I'm alone or in a crowd. As these melodies whirl around across my mind's rhythmic ground, the song has ended now long gone, but those sweet melodies linger on. They are from shows, records, and stage, tapes and CDs from many an age, musical ballads and operas too, familiar songs to me and to you. Gilbert and Sullivan come to mind, Verdi Puccini in like kind, Lerner and Lowe wrote very well, and Rogers and Hammerstein wrote pell-mell. From La Boheme to Rigoletto, stirring sound and clever libretto ran around my swirling head until my musical soul is well fed. Then I rest and again it starts, the Victrola of my musical heart, playing tunes that I hear and my soul begins to cheer. Pigtails and freckles from Mr. President, take me along from Jackie Gleason as resident. South Pacific, prescient on diversity, the student prince, Liquid University, the desert song recruiting 10,000, guys and dolls, serious carousing. I get a horse right here by Stubby K, Pinkerton, Pinkerton, un bel day. Miss Saigon, a sad lament, kismet, a musical tent, Oklahoma about Kansas City, and flower drum in Frisco City. Chorus line with TNA, how to succeed and never pay, Mamma Mia with Abba's hits. Pajama game with Union Grit. Damn Yankees, the bat is up. Fiorello's the little tin cup. The Music Man and Lida Rose and 42nd Street on your toes. The hills are alive, well of course they are. Climb every mountain here and afar. Younger than springtime, Lieutenant Joe Cable. Pinza and Martin in a wartime fable. Then the eerie music of the night creates a terrible audience fright as masquerade is sung in unison, a chandelier is loosed by lunacy. Revolution begins its men memorable biz as the curtain rises on Les Mis. Little Cousine, humble as a mouse, followed by the boisterous master of the house. Love conquers everything was the theme. In aspects of love, a thought so keen. And Hello Dolly was Broadway bound, propelled by Channing's gravelly sound. From Italy, it's the Tarantella, then a shift to most happy fella, then an Irish uprising in conflict in me between Danny Boy and the Rose of Tralee, and John McCormick's Janine, my queen, makes my Irish heritage preen, alongside a homebound Kathleen, underscored with fields of green. So off I go with head well tuned and with my musical memories ballooned, and files of music that often play in my head during my day. The songs have ended, but the melodies linger on. The curtains closed, but the scenes are never gone. But rather than let them continually torture us, I begin to hum Turandot's Vinciurus and sit back to gently remember my music adventures from May to December as our mutes remind us with lyrical and tone that we'll never ever walk alone. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh wow, the breadth that was of that! Fun. What a yeah. collection! That of, was fun. And, oh, I know. I've seen most of those and listened yeah. to other them, and just the great stuff. Yeah, great stuff. The history of music. Yeah. Well, the shows and yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There must be about five people in the country who go from John McCormick <laughs> to ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of territory. <laughs> I don't, say, to cover. I, say, I, don't, I don't know what kind of an algorithm Google can come up with to decide to which ads to send you uh, because that's a that's a broad spectrum. Mm. Wow. No, I love it. I love the theater and music. And, well, so. you you uh, oh, yeah. really made it clear in yeah. that poem and just ending with going. It, it reminds me of kind of yeah. this Gene Kelly attitude that oh, yeah. you know you're walking off into the sunset whistling a happy tune. Right. Which is what in we totally expect of you. In the rain. Totally in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. I feel like you took us through a musical. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. you know, I have to say, as an aside, um, when my, my younger sister and I do activities together, if we do, uh, we've done biking trips together, and, she, you know, she uh, powers on and I'm, I'm struggling, and so I say, how do you do it? How do you do the hills? I just cannot do those hills on the bikes. And she says, I just sing Broadway tunes. 
Mm -hmm. And ever since then, when I have this really tough physical thing to do, I belt out like Ethel Merman, Broadway <laughs> tunes. I'm just, it gets me through. Yeah, yeah type they are situation. so clever oh, and poignant, are. those songs. I mean, you know. The lyrics. And yeah, just I mean, younger than springtime. Mr. President was a great show when Jack Kennedy was, and I loved uh, A Little Tin Cup from Fiorello. And, oh, it's just mm -hmm. beautiful. And Stubby K. I got a horse right here. It was Paul Revere. Oh, well, gosh. Oh. this is a walk down memory lane. Yeah, and actually, oh, probably a little wonderful. before uh, our some time. Of them, some, some of them, them. Mm -hmm. were dating ourselves. All right, thanks, Tom. Okay. All right, Jerry, what do you have for us? Well, the, we talked a little bit about the prompts. I thought this was an evocative one. This is the, a prompt of a, a postcard oh, yeah. art right. from a hundred some years ago at the turn of the last century. And the week we got it, uh, the Cape Cod Times had an insert for a show up at, uh, up at, uh, in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, mm. the featured uh, picture was the nice. same woman on the postcard. So I started thinking about it and wrote the face on the card. I thought today of my granny and other old women in my life over 60 years ago. Hair pulled back tight, bosoms restrained by too much cotton cloth, all was more than the weather required. Faces placid with the knowledge of age, eyes staring, rehearsing memories of life in that time before the worlds first went to war. So easy to politely dismiss them, they were done. I could smell their end simmering on the stove, hear it ticking on the parlor clock. Granny watched while mother worked, kept me safe in the backyard, front gate latched told me useless things, like how she had seen a queen named Victoria. She's gone a long time now. No one still lives who once danced like it was 1899. In today's times, the MFA placed an ad insert touting an exhibition of fin de siècle postcard art. I saw a picture of a woman, young and ripe, beneath an antique hat, eyes full of mischief with a hint of regret at what pain she would cause when the card in her hand was red. I could see the beginnings of her full life and the soft curls of her flaming red hair and the lipstick pout half hidden in the upturned collar of her mouton lamb coat. This postcard beauty was contemporary with the old woman who shepherded my youth. I must revise my child's judgment of Granny. Life is not minute after minute, day after day, neat and sequential, like bound pages of a diary of record. Life is all one piece. We just access others at different spots. I miss the spot where my young granny's curls and pouty lips broke and won hearts. But she was there inside the old woman, old woman who must have wondered if I would ever understand. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy, that really, that mm. hits to a, a concept that is fresh and unusual in, in really speaks to you know our generations and how we view each other mm. it was beautifully done mm. yeah oh, thank Absolutely. you what was the um, what was when you said this I could smell their end simmering on the stove well she was a good cook but it was all fusty old grandma stuff that was up there <coughs> was dead that was a really interesting um, way to get to that, uh, that idea. I could smell their end simmering on the stove. And then the ticking of the clock, the, that always yes. meant to me but something also, it's gloom, amazing. gloomy. Hmm. It's amazing how something as inert as a picture can become dynamic, uh -huh. which is the, what you did. You took an inert photo, image, and then you interpreted it as you said, life is not a piece of it's a one, it's a unit kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Especially done, too. Mm. Yeah, that was a great concept that yeah. to see life as one unit and, and just how you access it at different points was, was wonderful. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Yeah. Karen, what do you have for us? Let's see. Uh, hmm. I think I'll read hmm. this one. I think we have time. For, we might all get one more. We might not. We'll see. 
Okay. That would be good. <coughs> um, this is called Jenny. Mm -hmm. Car with one flat tire like, I lurch around my apartment in circles, puffing as if in labor. What I come into this room for? Later, on return from the market, hot soup pulls on and into the back seat of my brand new hatchback. Jenny is in a coma, organs failing. Sister of my friend, sister-in-law to another, and friend of my own, Jenny. No visitors allowed, but heart and soul here, blah, 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 and make their way to her bedside while this body stays put, spilling, pacing, panting. Dusk arrives. Worry and love walk me outside. I look up and see Jenny. Jenny in the tall stand of eucalyptus trees, in the pink and yellow light coming through their branches, in the particles of air all around me. She is leaving, but not yet gone. I'm going inside, Jenny and fly up the stairs with fierce single-pointedness. Light candles, burn resin, place symbols, earth, wind, water, wood, and fire. Pull tarot cards, six of water, faith floats to the top. Dining room table becomes altar. Jenny, 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 the room fills with one word. Now from bed, flames continue to flicker. Frankincense still heavy in the air with the prayer. We love you, we love you, we love you. Do what you need to do. The sacred seeps from my walls and countless other homes that night. It overflowed and met in one great field of grace with all the stillness and deep quiet of winter's first snowfall. By morning, Jenny had awoken. I wonder about that night, what other miracles took place as love from around the world became one with Jenny's spirit, when she blessed us all and was everywhere we looked. Hmm. Yeah. Nicely done. You know, you captured a, a tough time uh, for anyone when they're worried about a, a friend's health mm -hmm. and that period of time where you're unraveling. But you had so much control over that unraveling part to be able to report in the reporting. <laughs> in the reporting, yeah. In the yeah. reporting, perhaps. <laughs> and the, your line with worry and love walked me outside, I mm. thought it was a really nice turn of a phrase. Um, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very personal. Did you know someone that... Oh, yeah, it's all yeah. <coughs> from yeah. a real account. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm happy to report she's alive and recovering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. That was a beautiful poem. Thank you. Um, let's see. I think I have... I'm going to read um, a short poem called A Remembered Sweetness. And as my children have grown and they are starting to have children, I'm um, taken with uh, the idea of how over, through generations do we continue our values and the stories that we want uh, from generation to generation. We want them to carry from previous times. Um, so this is my thinking about that. It's called A Remembered Sweetness. We can another season of jam, jewel-toned on the pantry shelf eager to taste the sweet apricot in February, hoping we've made enough, licking the jam spoon clean. It is the night that convinces us to look beyond the apricot grove into the cellar of our souls. A people long for permanence, so memory is born, stitched and cobbled, etched and sung, our offering sent into the spring of our daughters, into the dawn of our grandson's children, still warm from our industry, hoping the honeyed apricot does not lose its sweetness over time. Mm. And the metaphor of in the kitchen as a family doing those things that mm. are traditional. 
and the sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I tried to use the the jam yeah, making right. as right. Um, you know what vehicle. would be past the vehicle, yeah. right? Yep. Um, something basic. Yep. One of my favorite lines that I can recall was the jeweled jeweled tones on the sh on the shelf or mm. something like that. It was so vivid. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Thanks. It's funny how you know certain poems. Uh, hold you a little tighter, uh -huh. and this one I always come back to. I find it somehow it's ritualistic. reassuring. Ritualistic, yeah. Yes. And I, I'm all about the ritual. <coughs> Some people are all about the base. I'm all about the ritual. <laughs> okay. All right. So, oh, um, I think we might. Uh, I think we might stop there mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to cut us off in the middle of a poem, sure. Mary Ellen. Okay. But maybe. Um, we would end talking a little bit or showing our book and, uh, and oh, yeah. yeah, I'm Good thinking idea. I'd like to promote our book. So one of the things we do as a um, group every year, at the end of our time together, we choose a couple poems or a couple stories that we submit um, into a book that gets published. And we've accumulated, how many have we accumulated? I, I give nine. Ten, nine. nine. I have nine, yeah. All right. And they are at Gary the... must have more. We're yeah. at the Eldridge Library. No. Uh, we give them a copy every <coughs> year. Um, and every year, a, a different writer in our group does the cover because we have some very artistic, clever folks as well. So here's uh, our latest book, Chatham 02633, Chatham Writers 02633. And uh, if you're ever at the Eldridge Library, uh, and you'd like to look us up. It's got some of our uh, poetry, our stories. It's a great cross-section. And we're all represented, and many more of us as mm -hmm. well. Yes, right. Um, or if you'd like to go out on a limb yes. and buy it. Go out on a limb. <laughs> go out on a limb. www.lulu.com. You can and buy the first own. and only person in the United States to <laughs> buy one of this book. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We're really very pleased to share our writing with you. It's very nice. A nice night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.